Today's episode, we're going to talk about the concept of traveling. The concept of traveling has been around for centuries, from when it was really, really hard uh, to travel, it, the trips took far longer than today and were much more dangerous, uh, to today where we can cross continents in a matter of hours. Um, so to, to discuss a bit more this concept of traveling, I have here with me today Nico. Hello. Uh, hello Nico. He's a graduated student from He's Anglia Ruskin, so I'm a history graduate from Anglia Ruskin, which is the same as Sarah. Uh, I'm just a year above her. Uh, I may not be, you know, I haven't traveled much myself, but I am technically, uh, much as I am technically a citizen of the United Kingdom, uh, I am technically also an immigrant that have moved, has moved here for almost, almost 10 years ago. So, in regards to traveling... Where, where did you come from? I then? came from... Uh, as we call ourselves the Pearl of the Orient, which is Southeast Asia, in, the, in a country called the Philippines. Uh, and again, even, even that in itself is a, a different discussion, but on the topic of Sarah that's open, we would look into the, the history of traveling across the world, how we came to today, and what people should really expect if they're traveling, either in, within their continent or across continent, and you know, uh, people People could be accustomed to things easily, and to some people could be a completely a complete culture shock. So it's just going to be a good discussion, in all honesty. That is true. <laughs> just before we begin, uh, I would like to mention that today we are at Thrive. Thrive is a new, completely vegan uh, coffee shop slash restaurant that opened in Cambridge, where we both live. Um, mm -hmm. So we would really uh, like to thank Thrive for this opportunity to be using their space. Yeah, it's a fantastic space as well, uh, and. The person who has let us the room has been very lovely and welcoming, uh, and you know, in in regards to just with its uh, theme, it's a very rare thing to find in Cambridge. But keep an eye out. Um, so, Nico, we've been talking about this for a really long time, right? <laughs> uh, far too long. Far too yeah, long, far exactly. Too long. So, I would like to start um, by something you mentioned that it never came to my mind, okay. which was the times where uh, people used to travel without even having a world map, not knowing where they would yes. be Yes, I mean, this is... This you, you're going back almost before the estab like the establishment of what we now call as Western civilization, uh, and this is during the times of where there are people like there are things as map makers. There's no such thing as the concept of time. You know, time was something when the sun came up and the sun came down. People used things like sundials and whatnot. But the, again, I'm not the expert on this one, nor have I, nor am I an expert in the current state of traveling because. In all honesty, I've only ever been to one other country in Europe and I've been in the UK for almost 10 years. But and you are an enthusiast of it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm an enthusiast <laughs> of learning other cultures. You know, that interests me as someone from the outside. But back to the point of the idea of there are people that used to traverse places. So obviously you start at a ground level. And I say ground level, I mean literally ground level. So people were using carts, people were using, people would walk horses they would then get to places that then they would draw the map and know the you know it's an oral uh, bit of history and like m almost map making that's given down and then over time as uh, the western civilization developed you had more scholars more scholars that then had ambitions to think i would like to draw the map of the world you want to go to places obviously there's only so much that you can see you know everything that's around you and it's very human nature that you want to break outside your box you know, and I think that is shown in history as those adventurers and the people that went on to boats, especially in, in, it is very big in the medieval era as well, where people then went on boats and voyages to, yes. to explore other countries. And, you know, as maybe something that's been mentioned in Western history is that most Western uh, travelers are almost like explorers used to want to find what would have probably been India or something. They're looking for India, but a lot of play, a lot of, for example, in the context of perhaps where I am, and this is very subjective, is that I, my country was an old Spanish colony. And this is because a Spaniard of the name of, I believe he was called Ferdinand Magellan, 
or Majean, as I say in Spanish, uh, was looking for spices and was looking, was basically going further east and he was traversing wherever he went and landed on the first bit of land that he saw. He assumed we were of that sort of descent, uh, but again, in, obviously nowadays we know that it was completely wrong, but at the time we think it was a big discovery. He found spices, he found something that was exotic, especially in Asia. You know, right. in Asia, we always get exoticized very quickly because of there's this mysticism about Asia, you know, whether mm. it be the culture and if you, if, if to, to sound almost uh, terrible to back in the day, the women, the women, you know, very mysterious and, you know, right. mystic yes. and, it's, and it's something that isn't really seen uh, or demonstrated perhaps in the West for Western women. That's, that's a very big thing. Um, so yeah, in, in regards to uh, people traveling the world, again, can you imagine trying to travel today? You know, we, we are blessed with such things as GPS, you know, on phones, you know where you are, you don't have to ask and where you're, is... you're not traveling for the sake of just going to see whether you would stop somewhere, mm. right? Yeah. Because uh, at that time, most of the trips that they went to, they wouldn't even find anything. Where do you, yeah. You sort of landed where you saw a bit of land and explored because you've, it's uncharted territory. And that in itself is exploration and it's discovery. And to some people, that's that's what they dreamed of, you know. Mm. Uh, so we can we can definitely say that uh, the, the concept of traveling from a very very from the very very beginning would be travel to find something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as if today most of the people it tends to be travel for luxury and pleasure. That's something exactly. That <laughs> but but they do that because somehow. Everyone today is traveling to run away from something, <laughs> right? So the totally opposite yes. uh, of the concept that it used uh, to be at the it beginning. used to be at the beginning. There is something you mentioned before about the spices um, that I really want to go back to because in the era of Christom Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. uh, around the 15th century, mm -hmm. uh, there was a concept that was created which is called the Columbus Exchange, mm -hmm. uh, where especially in the Americas you would see um, lots of goods uh, and plants uh, being traded to uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. But with this also comes the bad part of trading people, trading mm. animals. Um, do you want to explore a bit more I about... Mean, in all honesty, this is uh, when it comes to explaining the history of... I mean, that just goes into the history of trade and as a first thing. But if we look at the idea of, you know, traveling nowadays for, I guess, in regards to your channel, in this podcast as well is that people travel for one of two things one is for pleasure that tends to be the first thing secondly tends to be educational so whether it be you're doing an exchange to program learn. or you're doing you know you want to learn more about a certain culture that perhaps you're interested in mm -hmm. like i know people that would probably want to stay in um <clears throat> in southeast asia and understand a little bit more about that uh Culture, culture. You know, there's. I mean, I had culture shock when I got to the UK. In all honesty, but this we is sort of. Yeah, we'll go back. We'll we'll touch upon <laughs> that much later. But it's this idea of uh, educating. You know, almost being. What's the word for it? Uh, there was a certain word that. Well, there's a certain word that my. Um, it will come. Yeah, it will come. I forget. <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll come back to me later. But there's a word that we use. Uh, when it comes to someone that wants to know basically most of the cultures in the world and wants to be almost like multicultural in itself and he, he, he it then fulfills his um, what's the word for it need to understand other people's culture and his sort of like hunger for information and you know this this is amazing this is interesting you know interest uh, that's really what uh, takes me to travel most of the times mm -hmm. I'm just uh, so fascinated with everything that goes around the world, all the different people that I've met, mm -hmm. all our differences uh, that make us unique. So that's probably the biggest reason why I travel. Uh, but Nico, I mentioned this era of where we would exchange products because that was how we started. But then we also moved into 
migration of people because mm. he would be comfortable to travel somewhere and people would start settling in, right? Yes, indeed. That's one thing that perhaps uh, makes sense as to when you see perhaps like this is something we can make an example for maybe South Africa. South Africa perhaps was an old colony uh, where people used to either trade or people used to at the uh, height of the British colony uh, they had traders that were obviously of British origin that were posted in South Africa probably to colonize the yeah not to colonize but it's to look after whatever it is for that specific company uh, holds in that or trades either export or import uh, and they tend to just stay there for the majority of the time that they work for that specific company and most of the time uh, people get comfortable and people just settle in all honesty that's why you see sort of uh, and this, this was news to me as again as someone I ne did not know anything about British uh, imperial rule is um, I never understood like you're from South Africa but you're obviously of white skin and that, that to me was a bit well, what's, I, I, what's I don't quite understand and oh then you realize it's an old British colony people settled there and they just basically became South African there is lots of people uh, living here mm -hmm. as you said white collar that come from South Africa so probably because they have those mm -hmm. ancestries and then vice versa as well that also happens with other things like you like perhaps the most the largest thing is in America you've got yeah. Right. Yeah. You've got the African Americans. That's that's a big thing. Most of these people have been there because of a very dark and something that perhaps it's not what we would want to talk about in this podcast. But uh, they were there over like for a very dark reason. But over time, uh, they settled. You know, as they got their rights back, they fought for their rights. They settled. You know. So now having a black American is a thing. You know, that, that's just something that comes with, we say, once is travel and then once people have settled. Let's stay in the 16th century just mm -hmm. for a second. Um, in the 16th century, England uh, was passing through a very hard period in terms of uh, death with, within the government. Mm. Um, and at that time, there is something really funny that I've just found out when I moved to England because mm -hmm. I'm originally from Portugal mm -hmm. and this was a story that I got told just before I moved here and I find this fascinating so I, I really want to share it. Uh, which is something that we associate to the British culture such as the tea time yes. and the afternoon teas. Mm -hmm. um, He's something that comes from Portugal, from Portuguese culture. And this was a really big surprise for me. Mm -hmm. So a big surprise in the sense that something that we only associate to England has actually uh, an origin. Had a different origin. Exactly. But then again, you... you and, and the story yeah. behind this is, mm -hmm. is just really simple, is that um, to overcome those deaths within the government, um, the King Charles II uh, thought that maybe a wealthy marriage with a Portuguese uh, princess called Catarina de Bragança uh, would be the solution for that because Portugal was uh, importing so, lots of spices and lots of goods from other places mm -hmm. so they were doing really well at the time and within the, ma the, the marriage uh, agreement mm -hmm. they agreed that Portugal would export to England mm -hmm. and within those exports was the tea leaves that were something that Cat uh, Princess Catarina was really really appreciative of <laughs> um, and why did this become a, co a cultural thing? Because uh, the princess, when she established in England, mm -hmm. uh, she called this the tea, uh, because for her, the word tea had the meaning of, uh, translating from Portuguese, is uh, transport of aromatic herbs, uh, which in Portuguese is transporte de ervas aromáticas, which spells the letter, the tea. word tea, right? Um, and, and this for her was a concept that she would always do every afternoon mm -hmm. uh, at the place which was called the white closet within her palace mm -hmm. and everyone got into the idea of having a tea break during the, the afternoon mm -hmm. with some scones, finger sandwiches <laughs> and favorite. today 
if you come to England, something that you must do is have go for a go to a tea room, like right? A proper have tea a quick afternoon tea, tea experience. So this really fascinates me the way that uh, even though something is significant, significantly known in a culture, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean it's from that culture. Right. And again, it's something that is again. This is why you would study. You would see it in history as where it came from. Right. Again. You, it's easy to forget that Britain once upon a time ruled a third of the world. Right, that is time. true. Okay, and that is true. And things change a lot. No, yeah, <laughs> things change a lot. You know, and that, you know, at the time it was the biggest thing. It was the biggest, almost, to to, to sound <laughs> overly done. It's, it was the biggest fashion between countries and uh, you know settlements is to to take land, mm. uh, and it, it's easily done. It's, it's easily done at the time because. Again, to sound almost crude, uh, when people in the imperial times, people used to go to, when people would discover other countries, they tend to be some of the tribal of people. And then you do the old gun beat spear thing, and then you take over the land, and then you start taking right. whatever they produce, and you make it as your own, as your own export, which then turns into trade. Right. And it turns into perhaps another thing again. Trade plus, uh, you know, trade that brings money in. To trade the brings money in, and that's what builds empires. That's what builds empires. Trade, uh, and in regards to to the tea story, uh, the one thing originally, and this is this is my experience with tea before I had studied history, is that tea in my culture was if you were sick. You had tea if you were sick. It's a medicine. It's a medicinal tea. I never thought tea as a beverage to have in the afternoon. I mean, fair enough. I live from a really tropical country where it's almost 40 degrees right. every, every single day. But tea in itself, I've always thought was oriental. You know, it's medicinal. Uh -huh. Especially and from India. Es fast. Especially from India. Well, like, you have to think that one there. But India being the most known British colony, that's why... Britain became almost this like major ex like yes, that is true. exporter and importer of tea. And then, you know, that, that settled in really with, uh, even within the country, like I mean, a good example perhaps would be, um, let's, let's take, let's take for example, coffee, not coffee, but China. Oh yeah. China, yes. mugs and teacups and pots. There was a, a culture in 19th century Britain, Victorian Britain, of um, when commodities, when I say commodities, like luxuries, such as like, you know, affording a teapot or a tea set, you know, where you have tea, you have mugs, you know, little teacups, you've got sauces, you've got the pot, and you, especially the tea, you know, uh, in the culture of afternoon tea, you'd even look better if you had a tea set. And there that's... is also an expression mm -hmm. uh, that says people behave well when they're eating from China. Yeah. So I guess that's also a symbol of this means something. This it means something, you know, it has, it has history to it and when you do it, it's, you're almost partaking in something that's been written down and it's been done before by your predecessors and your ancestors. And I think in itself that's really like, amazing, you know, you yes. would never think that, you know, especially with uh, tea as well again. Uh -huh. I think. Moving along from there. Right. Yes. And, and it's funny because um, from my idea as a Portuguese person, uh, tea would be something that you would drink um, a specific tea for each problem, let's say. Each thing would have a specific tea that you could drink. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I moved here, everyone drinks an English breakfast. I'm not yeah. saying that it's not a good tea. I'm just saying that <laughs> There are other options on the table as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, when people say tea, they immediately think, you know, breakfast tea, it's black tea. Uh, it's like the alternative to coffee, which again, not a lot of English people did get accustomed to. Uh, again, if you want to speak about coffee, that dates another back. That that's, another, that's another story, that's another culture that has obviously then come to us. Usually. So we can say <clears throat> from this brainstorming that mm -hmm. definitely travel has made a huge impact on the history of the world in terms of 
Make to what you yeah, to what you expect almost in every country. You'd expect every country to have almost like just in this one, like tea and coffee. You know, right? You'd, you'd expect yeah, yeah, it from yeah, every yeah, country yeah. because it's almost globalized. You know, because as because at from those times till today, not only the people can go mm-hmm. everywhere, but the products itself yeah. they they can travel everywhere. everywhere. Right, mm-hmm. and and from your country because you come from the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the thing that you would say that characterizes your country in terms of culture? It doesn't have to be a drink. It can I be mean, just a <laughs> something. It's something. I mean, all I can say is that the way I see my country and the way I see where I've come from is that we're almost an amalgamation. And I say an amalgamation, it's just it's a combination of so many things that doesn't make sense. Like if if I was to explain it in a very in a basic manner, right? I'm Asian. But my last name is Latin, whether it be Spanish or Latin exactly. American. Nico Ignacio. And and I speak two languages, and you know, there, there's so many things. It, it's just such a weird concept, you know, this idea of this globalism that right. had already pre-existed. You know, like I have, I can speak another language. My name is not even of Latin. I've got a Spanish last name. I'm technically what you call Asian. <laughs> you know, it's 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 so weird when I have to tell people I'm like where I came, where I come from. It's 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 so weird because they can't pin it down. You know, so that's what happens during you know people trying to. But th- th- okay, you have a fair <clears throat> point in that one. Uh, but you cannot you cannot say that someone is from a country because they look like this. Yes, because. People travel <coughs> and people settle down. Mm-hmm. People from different cultures and from different countries, they mix together and mm-hmm. they start a generation after generation, mm-hmm. which implies that the next generations wouldn't be as pure, if you want to call it that way, mm-hmm. as the people from each country would look like. Sure, that's true. I mean, we live in a, in a world where traveling is made easier. And also when you settle in a different country, it tends to not be frowned upon. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, and I mean to to go off from this one, we had a conversation about there are other countries that are preserving their almost pure uh, right. race of people. Not to say that they're like Puritans, where we don't want your like you know they don't treat other races as uh, almost regressive or like dirty or anything to sound terrible. Um, I mean, we take this for example, and I, I could say this about like Japan is a very good example. Japan, you cannot get a settled citizenship in Japan. You can get a settlement, you can settle, but you can never be a citizen of the country of Japan if you're not Japanese in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that in its, I'm not saying that because either they're xenophobic or anything like that, but as I view it in my subjective view, is that it's them trying to preserve almost their people because people may embrace the idea of globalization and everyone mixing and you know it'll be it'll be the same will be the same race at the end of 200 years or so <laughs> yeah. uh, but some people you know having a certain race of people you know I think it's not going to disappear but that's that's one way to sort of well, make make a sta- make a statement about yeah. it. That's just as a country. Yeah, but th- think this way: you come from the Philippines, you're living in in England. I come from Portugal, I'm living in England, and so many people from around the world are living here right now. All of us are mixing together. Who says that within thousands and thousands of years we mm. don't become all? A single race, if mm-hmm. you want to call it this way. Yeah. E- even though, in my honest opinion, we are a single race, race yeah. which is human race. Yeah. So let's talk about the one that we both have an opinion on: greeting. Greeting. That's a good. Okay, one. we're going to compare greeting uh, from our cultures, Portugal and Philippines, <laughs> to the greetings that you have in England. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, when when we would greet in my country. Uh, it, it doesn't tend to be a word, nor is it like a, it's a, you know, we usually just nod, almost similar to most Asian people or Asian cultures. But there's a sound that only Filipinos emit when they greet each other, Which and is? it's a really weird sound. They go oh, and and this is the funny thing, right? Different intonations can mean different things. 
if it's a lower a lower oh. a lower o it tends to be something serious and like uh what's the word for like what what are you doing here almost but when it's a bit higher pitched you go oh you know <laughs> you're like how are you like how's your family it's 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 something that we only we understand when we go when people go oh depending on the intonation people catch on it there it's weird no. it's weird that i have to think about it now back in the day i think normally do it it's fine i know what i'm trying to say and they know what i'm trying to say I'm doing that and nowadays I struggle to understand what people are saying because I'm, I got used to mm. asking people again culture shock in the UK when people go you're all right and I'm like why won't I be all right do you know what I mean that's that's but something is, that yeah there is a cultural thing here asking if you are all right but yeah. they don't even want an answer no they just say that because it's, it's almost lies. like an equivalent of saying hello or yes. like hi yeah Yeah. something like that but that's that's my thing but right but that's um that's the way you approach someone when you go and talk right uh but greeting itself um you would only talk to people no we wouldn't there's no such we if you if you had if you shook hands that that's the maximum pe- people think i'm like are you making a deal of some sort right. you know so for you in yeah. your culture it would be just talking talk eat talk right. yeah So f- from my background people kiss they kiss a lot. Mm. Um so if we see someone we would immediately give two kisses. Although this might change with coronavirus. No, I'm that's really not. Sure. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the thing used to be that we would meet someone even though we've never seen that person in our lives mm-hmm. before. The first thing we we would do is a kiss and mm-hmm. then we would introduce ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh so when I moved to England Uh, on my induction week i was meeting lots of different people and the mm-hmm. first and th- all those people were from around the world and the first thing i u- i went to do was immediately to kiss them and that's when i realized that not everyone greets the same way mm-hmm. so especially people from england they don't kiss no no they like a good hug though and and they to, are and, and in all honesty like as someone who's now settled on like i lo- i love a good hug when someone's like I've been I, I like it too. Yeah, I, lo- I love I love yeah. it. So it's But fine. but but for you, that's a, yeah, that's a sign of affection. If you were to hug someone in my culture, that would have been like it's oh, too oh, intimate. It's too intimate. So yeah. that So even, that was a cultural shock. It's a big shock to you, I mean, think about it. Like yeah. the next ver- the next step from a hug is a kiss, but then again, like think about it. In Portuguese yeah, it was right. normal. And but right. for me, hugging I'm like, "Oh, oh no, I don't know. Right. I don't, I don't know who you are." And and nowadays both of us are huggers. Yeah, and as we're doing it's something that you settled. you settle. You, you understand it and you think, "Oh, you know what? It's, it's it's a good way to greet someone." And that's when you you open your mind and you sort of get influenced by right. where you are. I drink tea now. I used to hate tea. <laughs> That's one so thing. So it's not thing. a medicine anymore. Not even a medicine anymore. It just it gets me through the day. Um what else that's really weird? I mean the I guess the shops closing like early, you know. Sunday at timing like Sundays. <laughs> Sunday is a family day for, for sure. No, Sunday yeah. is family day like psst, psst, psst. everything opens later and closes earlier. Mhm. And back home Sunday is just a normal day everyone works as normal. normal. And and when I say to my mom no I can't because everything is closed she's like really is Sunday. <laughs> and I was like yeah that's why. That's why <laughs> you know. I mean Sunday is sort of sacred within like the UK because it's like a rest day within the week. It's the last day of the week before it. you go back to work. And that has its own history, you know. That's some history but then again it's self explanatory, you know. You work 9 to if you work 9 to 5 Monday to Friday. you'd have Saturday and you have Sunday off which is your rest day but everything's short you know um and it's also like fair on people that do work the Sundays you don't have to work too long and just you can enjoy your, you can enjoy some of your Sunday Nico just to conclude this uh and moving to the importance of travel today um now that it's so easy to travel mm-hmm. and it's so mainstream to travel Uh what is your um advice for people should people travel uh, should people get engaged with other cultures what I mean say? this is something that I say as someone who's obviously technically a foreigner still much as I have my citizenship I'm still a foreigner I still treat myself as a foreigner in the UK is that when you go to another country when you travel you do your best to understand you know and uh, as understand and uh, tolerate as much as you can people can easily be think oh that's terrible but you travel there and you you know when you travel and when you open yourself to other cultures 
that's when you open yourself as a person to you know accept it and try you can't get offended because that would just probably ruin it right. and you think and they think that you're someone who's a bit insensitive you know you try it and then once you've tried it and then once you've gotten to know them that's when you express maybe not so much but be open to try you know that's because ex- you can't really buy that experience yes that is yeah that experience comes when you come you don't just sort of pay for it and go again please so embrace it as much as much as you can you know learn from it and take it on board because when you go to a different country perhaps they have something fairly similar but you know again it can be entirely different and that just saves you from being shocked every time like every time you go somewhere else and different does not necessarily mean bad. bad no no it's no, no, it's no. sometimes or most of the times a good thing because it's we you learn more mm-hmm. it's more knowledge and, and you just become a better person, person. Um, so so yeah I agree with you I think people should at least try it give it a try like I wouldn't you know necessarily <laughs> I can make a ton of examples of what you should, what you have to try when you go to the Philippines. But, another time. But never another again, time. but that's another time. Another time. Okay. We'll go back to that later. Um, so just to conclude this, uh, I think traveling as we've proved today uh, has changed the history of the, the world, world. Uh, from its beginning to today. And, and so keep on traveling because as we mentioned, the history itself has been written to uh, of people who traveled and and to travel has definitely made a difference um, so keep on traveling as i said before go further to be better mm-hmm. uh, and thank you nico thank you for no being worries, here today for, me. for sharing your knowledge your experience whatever knowledge that i can give I can, i'll give it was enough <laughs> <laughs> it was very great to have you here thank you for tribe to uh, giving you this yeah. place to us to record this video uh, and you if you are from cambridge please come and visit their uh, new uh, place it's amazing it's, it's in sea. it is well done it is in a central location their coffee is fantastic i'm just glad i i drank that slowly as i could and and, and their ethos is just so genuine and so natural that it is something that you should really consider to try as well at least once at least once as we were saying and once you like it then do please support thank you thank you and and thank you nico one more time thank you for watching this episode please leave your feedback below Uh, i will happily um, reply to your questions and i see you on the next episode cool see you you later bye ciao (laughs) you're gonna make your coffee here again (laughs) Is this the right thing? <laughs> Probably. It's hot. Maybe it's for the... <laughs> Three, two.